we come to the chapter that I've been looking forward to and dread this whole time. This is the most important event story of all time in the Bible. I'm going to pray before I begin. Father, thank you for writing down what you've done for us so that we can over and over take our time. And let, it, let our minds and our hearts absorb it. I pray that you will deeply touch us. We've heard about <clears throat> your death on the cross so many times. But I pray that it, you will help us absorb it deeply more than we ever have. It's impossible for us to <clears throat> completely appreciate it. Someday we will. But today I ask that you will help us to have open hearts and willing emotions. As we go over this chapter one more time. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Like most Roman officials of his day, Pilate functioned for one thing to keep the peace of Rome. Everything they did was to keep all the countries they had conquered subdued so they wouldn't cause any trouble. The potential for a riot in Jerusalem would attract even a courageous government. Pilate must have known that he was not the one in control. Jesus spoke when he wanted to and kept quiet when he didn't want to talk. Probably most prisoners would either have been so subdued they wouldn't have said anything or would have argued and tried to press their case out of fear and terror. Throughout this chapter, these two last two chapters, 18 and 19, we see careless justice, sloppy religious and political leadership, many being legal laws were broken in the tribes. Yet through it all, God worked to provide the ultimate and only sacrifice for our salvation. His exactness magnified the carelessness of human leaders. But we must never be careless about the cross. It's not wrong for us to wear crosses and have knickknacks around our house to remind us. But we need to be more aware that the cross is not a gold thing on a hill looking pretty. We must not be distracted from the horror of the violent and torturous form of Roman persecution. The Romans were really good at torture and humiliation. They had it down to the science. They did it on purpose. The, the Jesus coming before Herod is not in John, so I'm not going to really go into it. But somewhere between the end of chapter 18 and the beginning of 19, Pilate sent Jesus to Herod. Pilate was delighted when he discovered that Jesus was from Galilee because Herod was the governor of Gal the Galilee section of that land. So he thought, well, good, I can get out of this. He said, get Jesus off my hands. So he sent him to, get to Herod, who was in Jerusalem at the time. Herod was full of pride. He and his leaders mocked him. What Herod really wanted, according to Luke, was to see a miracle. And he was the one, if you remember, who murdered John the Baptist. But Jesus said, absolutely nothing. Now keep in mind, I may have said this before, Jesus is a descendant of Jacob, and Herod is a descendant of Esau. So their ancestors all through time have been enemies. And here they were now. Herod, Herod just wanted Jesus to do something, and Jesus kept his mouth shut. And Herod sent him back to Pilate with I find no fault in him. They put a purple robe on him, made fun of him, and sent him back to Pilate. When 
got back to cut it, we had him fall. <coughs> Cruzy's always got a hallmark of sin. <coughs> for the flogging, he was a criminal, but a strip naked, and tied to a post by the wrist, and he was whipped. Now, in the Jewish culture, if they flogged a prisoner or a criminal, <coughs> they had some restrictions. They could only whip 40 times. Even that bothered my mind. One's probably too many in. But there would be somebody there counting to make sure they didn't go past the point. They also were restricted to only the back. But the Romans had no such restrictions. They could whip as long as they wanted to, and it didn't have to be restricted to the back. The lashes would come around with the face, the neck, the throat, the chest, the back, the buttocks. And if they started to pass out, they could stop. <clears throat> that gave them sense of a little bit and then to go. And this is something I didn't realize. They invited spectators. Because you see, the Romans not only perfected torture, they perfected humiliation. And they did it to keep the people who they were really over. Something I want you to notice. Uh, they had already said, when you take Barabbas <clears throat> instead of Jesus, it was their custom to release one prisoner in exchange for somebody they had. And he was hoping that maybe they would do that. Bar Barabbas means son of a father. Bar is son. Abba is father. Jesus was the son of the that's the thing they already said about him. I don't think there was anything on him or filming on your on your notes for that. Opportunity. There was one. I'm going to just read this before I go on. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him draw. I hate it that he just said, and had him draw. I don't know why John didn't go into more detail. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. I'm not getting them because he put my thumb with a rose, rose thorn. They crammed this on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, O King of the Jews. While they're being flogged, the audience had the right to throw anything at them, to say whatever they wanted. They would have gotten close to the slap, and that would hurt them, but they could do all things. But just continued the mock. Once more Pilate came out to the Jews and said, Look, I'm bringing it out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against you. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said, Here's your man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. The Romans were very proud of all their gods. And so he may have taken that as if they were claiming that Jesus was one of the gods. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where did you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. 
Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, I have tried to set him free. The Jews kept shouting, crucify. One of the questions that you had in the, in the lesson this week was why do you think Pilate brought him out for them to see? Why do you think he offered Barabbas? Perhaps he was hoping that if they saw their fellow countrymen beat up, bruised, broken, it would be, you know, they'd have some pity. They did. And Pilate was even now more afraid of him. He must have been astonished. How dare you not talk to me? Jesus stood there knowing he would have no power at all if God hadn't given it to him. Why was he afraid? It doesn't actually tell us here. But there had been riots while Pilate was the governor. He didn't want any more. He'd lose his job or his life. The Caesar wasn't much more protected than Pilate than he was up for anybody else. To buy him, you go. The pilot was going to pay for him. Maybe he was afraid the mob would break into a riot and he'd be good. <laughs> Climax of human hatred requires no rationale. God and the rebellious children of Adam, enemies. And enemies of him. This wasn't just Pilate and his soldiers and the Jewish leaders. It's the same. Pilate was still with him. No proof, no logic. Just people who were pain killed him. And we are among them. Before relief, we were also enemies of God. But, oh Jesus, we desired your death. Back into a corner. I have forgiven you. It's very easy for us to sit here, come to the chairs, or in room, out of the barn, and judge all of that. We were all more sin nation. There's no mother in the world that can tell you that their baby, before they can even sit up, <coughs> didn't scream in anger and fury because it didn't get them up. That only increases the awkward. Jesus died as much for my sin as for anybody else's. I just highlighted some of the aspects of this. It didn't take the criminals being crucified and getting to the side as was possible. They put the cross piece on their shoulders. And I read in one book that they even chained their wrist to it so they could down on the cobblestone street to match your face. And they took them the longest route through the city they possibly could for humiliation, as well as for it to last longer. Though John was my witness, he said little about the pain and agony. The streets were crowded with Passover celebrants. When I was in Jerusalem, it was right after Easter, which would mean it was for the Easter of the Eastern Orthodox churches that week. So the street was crowded. You could hardly get through. And I thought, man, how could you get through with it? Beads sticking out like this. It was over 100 pounds. His back, his sides, his shoulders ripped to the bone, much loss of blood, shaking with pain and exhaustion. And even though it's not in John, we know the final soldiers got cut with their
So I was still arguing about the day and the place. There's no question about the fact. No question. Seems like they pretty much maximized it was the pain and suffering any way they could. Yes, it did. And made it last as long as they could. And, 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 as as and the thing is, too, they knew how much and in what way to quit which would make the time on the cross longer or shorter. I don't know which would be worse, more whipping or more hanging. They just enjoyed the torture. And they did it to keep their subjects separate. And the streets weren't like downtown Fresno either. High walls, high buildings, close streets, close together. People walking and carrying lands on the way from the slot of the temple. It tends to sell. Hard enough to move through the streets anyway. Even alone. Even the more dead than alive. Another thing they did to humiliate was to make a sign with what your crime was, and then he put the rope around your neck. So not only was he carrying this beam, or his thing, but I mean, against his ripped up chest. Do you want to this? I know. Don't be right with that. When they would get there, then it would be hung on the cross. Three languages that were spoken Latin, Aramaic, and Greek. Nobody could miss it. Nobody could. These words, Pilate went to God. Let me read that. Let me so just took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Father. Here they crucified him with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign that the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests and the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, that this man claim to be King of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I've written, I've written. He meant it to mock both the Jews and Jesus. For it was the truth. Good news. There were no fewer than 20 Old Testament prophecies fulfilled within that 24 hours. That'd be a great study sometimes just to go through those prophecies. I'm going to read just a couple. I like to read Psalm 22 every week. I'm going to read just bits of it. Mind you, this was written by David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groanings. Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, I am not sad. I am a worm, not a man, scorned by men, despised by people. All who see me mock me, they hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusted the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a spot, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has took with me. I pierce my hands, I, they have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and go over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothes. For he is not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He is not in this face from him, but has listened to his cry for mercy. They proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, he has done 
That's only part of that chapter. Right in the back, David wrote, God, he, he, he wasn't writing about Jesus, but the words absolutely totally fit Jesus. <coughs> Another one I want to read. I can find it real quick. Hebrews chapter 5. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his forever submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. He once made perfect to the king of the swords of eternal salvation. The father heard him. He didn't answer his, please don't let me do this, do it some other way. And because that word of Jesus was denied. We have salvation. Jesus knew that his four half brothers were not yet believers. Perhaps the two people who loved Jesus the most were Mary and John. It was the son's responsibility in their day for the man to take care of his mother. In their culture, if you didn't have a husband and you didn't have children, you didn't have much of anything. But Jesus said to her, Mary, this is your son. And to John, he said, this is your mother. And from that day, he took her home with him. John was also the youngest of the group, probably an older teenager. So he would have lived perhaps a little longer. But uh, there are no other reasons. I'm not told at all. Just that he gave his mother a place where she might sit. And yet, and yet. I'm going to read on. Later, knowing that all was completed, and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they sucked the sponge in it, put the sponge on the stock. About his plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Now, I just read the wine vinegar was not a painkiller, but the truth, the throat must be the person of the truth. For more torture. Treating also can have some grief, and that wouldn't just stop that much from him. But when he, when he received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And the bad about his head, he gave up his spirit. I don't think he said this page. I think the devil was not a spirit. It was his last report to his father. It was a declaration, a picture of the substitutionary death for us. Probably a good thing that God has given us the ability to release our spirit when we feel like it. God decides that unless you commit suicide. But Jesus was able to release his spirit through his father's hands. I'm going to do this. God is on your cross. Creator of the universe is being executed. Spit and blood are caked to his cheeks, and his lips are cracked and sore. Thorns grip his scalp. His lungs spring with pain, his legs knock with cramps. Top nerves let the snap as pain claims. Yet, yet he's not ready. Yet no one there to save him, for he is a sacrifice of himself. But far worse than the breaking of his body is the shredding of his heart. His own countrymen clamored for his death. His own disciple planted a kiss of betrayal, and his friends ran to cover. And now his own father is beginning to turn his back on him, leaving him alone to take the father's wrath alone. A witness could not help but ask Jesus, Do you give a thought to saving yourself? What keeps you there? What holds you to the cross? What makes you stay? I'll have some next with him. So he didn't, one thing he made a Love. The Jews are still clamoring. 
At sundown, it was the beginning of the Sabbath, which was the beginning of the Passover celebration. And their loss had could basically been uh, above ground after sundown. So they went back to Pilate and said, break their, break their legs so that they'll die so that we can bury them. And the reason breaking the legs would cause death to come faster is because the whole time you're on your cross, you kind of push up, take a breath, sink. That would go on, of course, hanging hurt and pushing up hurt. But now they can no longer push up, so they start to kick. That was the day of preparation. The next day was to be special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have their legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it, surely as you're going to do so, John, has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may believe. These things happen so that the scripture will be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and another will be broken the one that appears. If he'd been still alive, it would have only been blood. But because he was dead, he began to separate from his blood. Not water like the, the bad drinking chapter of the bad water the body has. Later, Joseph of Arimathea and asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but see, you realize that the few hours he was on the cross was a very short crucifixion. Sometimes they last for days, even up for some weeks. Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial custom. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was a Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Those two men had been secret followers. Nicodemus was a little more known, and we, as we saw him, we went through it, we were kind of we saw him. They were both on the same Hebrew. They had everything to lose by identifying himself with the dead Jesus. But they had nothing to gain in their human life, and yet they came to do it. If on the third day, and the tomb was empty, there had been more than one body in there, there had been a lot of questions about what happened to Jesus. They landed in a tomb where there had been nobody else. And on Sunday morning, that was the only body that was missing. I'm going to read you from Second Corinthians. First Corinthians, I'm sorry. I'm not in the next one. Something that Paul wrote. No, I won't get too far into it because that's next week. For what I received, I pass on to you as the first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve, and then in some more. The proof that he died was that he was buried. The proof that he rose again was that he was seen. This chapter reminds us that we participate in both the cross and the tomb. 
It took the disciples a while to even realize that the resurrection was anything more than their getting back. And somebody I know that and came back, I'd be thrilled. But there was a lot more to it than that. And that's what we're going to get into the next week. The end of your notes. I'm going to read this. You can follow along or you can just listen. This is extremely important. Religious wars have been fought for centuries over the question, who killed Jesus? Some blame the Jews, others the Romans, and there are, those are two of the four answers the New Testament provides. The other two, Jesus and Father, however, point to humanity in general and God to God himself. Every human participated in the sin nature whose penalty Jesus paid on the cross. We are all equally guilty in making his death necessary. But the cross is not simply or even primarily the result of the malice of men, but it is the work of God. Secretly, unsearchably, but nonetheless certainly, God's mastering love moved behind the malice of men. They did their worst, but in their worst, God did his best. Out of different motives, all of them bad, Judas, Caiaphas, Pilate, and all the soldiers actually united to accomplish God impossible to describe good will. It's a fundamental and repeated doctrine in the New Testament that we have in the death of Christ, not merely the hand of God, but principally the hand of God. Not merely the hand of men, I'm sorry. Principally, the hand of God. Christ's death was neither an accident nor even a martyrdom, but a sacrifice. <coughs> Just pray. Thank you, Father, for sending yourself. Thank you for planning a great spend time. That which would redeem us from the slavery of sin. And then you gave us your spirit. Do it the way you want us to, because we are learning all the time. Thank you doesn't seem big enough or loud enough or strong enough. That's what you want us to do this today. So we thank you. And may we leave today with, again, a stronger sense of what you've done for us, which means that then we have a stronger sense of responsibility to tell others. I pray that the discussion in the group today will be heartwarming and encouraging. I pray in Jesus' name.